In this video, you're going to learn everything you need to know about Git, which is an essential tool in the software engineering space. Git is used by many companies and by pretty much the entire open source community, but there's still a lot of criticism around it for being too complicated and hard to learn by beginner developers. And I can totally agree with this because I learned and I'm still learning a lot of valuable lessons in over 10 years of working with Git. So hopefully to make this learning journey easier for you, I decided to create this video where we're going to learn the concepts around Git like commit, branch, repository, and many others, things that usually take some time to internalize their actual meaning, the basic Git commands which help us to get things done faster, the development workflow with Git and how it should be used properly by developers that work on the same project, and the way we use Git with GitHub. So with that, make sure to smash the subscribe button because I can see that a lot of you guys are not subscribed to this channel and let's get started. All right, so first things first, what is Git, right? So by definition, Git is an open source distributed version control system that allows developers to track changes on their code base, to experiment with different features without changing the original source code, to roll back to previous versions, and to manage changes done by many developers on the same code. So in these days, if you want to work with multiple developers on the same project, without Git, it will be a complete nightmare. Nightmare. Now let's say we have this very simple Spring Boot application. How do we use Git to track changes for it? First, we need to install Git on our local system by going to git-scm.com and SCM stands for Source Control Management and we just have to go on downloads and get a binary for our operating system. We know that Git was installed properly when we go on terminal and type git and then enter and we should see this help output. Now in order to work with Git there are two main options. We can use the command line utility or the CLI or we can use a tool which has a UI interface like source tree, GitHub desktop or many others. In this video we're going to use only the command line because this is how you learn Git in a universal way by not depending on a particular application. Now having it installed, the first thing we need to do is to set our identity by running those two commands, of course updated with your name and email. Now with those configs set up, let's create a new repository which is a git abstraction for a trackable directory that holds your code base. The way we can create a repository is by typing git init command and this will create a new repository in our current directory. We can see that a number of changes happened in the terminal. We have those hints that we can ignore for the moment, we have this master keyword attached to the prompt that we can ignore as well and we have a new hidden directory called .git which contains some metadata that git manages internally. The only thing you need to know about this directory is that if you delete it, Git will not work anymore because it will not have any metadata. We can always check the state of our repository by using the git status or simply gst command and as you can see it says nothing to commit which means that we don't have any files in this repository that are tracked by git. So let's do that by copying our Spring Boot project into this directory. And now if we check the status again, we can see that Git shows us those newly copied files as being untracked, which means that by default Git doesn't track changes for new files that are being added in a repository. We need to tell Git to do that by saying git add star, which marks all those files as being tracked by Git, right? And we can see that now if you run git status again. Now the next thing we need to do is to create a commit with all those changes by running the following command, git commit minus m and the message that describes those changes. Right. In this case, we add the initial project. Now, if we check the status, you can see that all those files have disappeared from the output because we just told Git that we want to record all those changes in the commit that we just created. And if we type git log, we can see our commit message, the author identity, the commit ID, and the timestamp when the commit was created. So what is a commit based on what we've just seen? A commit is simply a set of changes described by a message and also by an ID that git generates when you create a commit. The best way to see a commit is just like a checkpoint in your code base. And uh, the current state of your code is basically the result of all the commits in your repository which are applied sequentially on your initial code base. Git allows us to point to a different commit in the history if we want to check the code state in that particular moment and also we can revert the changes of a commit by using the git revert command and passing in the commit ID. Now let's make a change in our application. Let's say we modify those two files. If we run git status now, we can see our files being detected as changed by git so we can use git add command to include them in a future commit. Git add doesn't create the actual commit, it just selects the files that we intend to include in a particular commit, right? This procedure is called staging. For example, if you want to unstage a file or unmark it for being included in a future commit, we just have to run this command 
git restore dash dash staged followed by the file name and we can see now that our file is no longer staged. We can create a commit now with only the file that is currently staged. Now what if you want to revert an uncommitted change that we've made on a particular file? We can go directly to that file in IntelliJ IDI and revert the change manually or we can run git checkout command with the file name and this will restore the file to its original state, right? Which is the one before the change. This command will save you some time by avoiding the manual revert, mostly if the change is quite big. Now let's see how can we revert a change that is already committed. We first need to get the commit ID for the commit we want to revert, and then we need to run the git revert command followed by the commit ID, right? And that's it basically. If we check the log now, we can see that git revert actually creates a new commit for the revert operation. And of course, it's useful to preserve the history of the changes on our repository. Now, all those commits that we just created can only be seen by us. They are available only on our local repository. In order to make them available for other developers, we need to use a remote repository which is basically a cloud hosted version of your code where all the developers have access, right? Now, if you want security, you can create your own Git server on a virtual machine in the cloud, but a simpler option is to use GitHub, which is a service owned by Microsoft that allows us to create remote repositories for free. So we're going to use GitHub in this video, basically. First, you need to create a GitHub account. And then after you log in, you're going to see a screen like that one with a bunch of stats around your repositories and your contributions. To create a repository, you need to go on the top right corner and click on this uh, plus button and then on a new repository. You need to add a name for your new repository and you need to select whether you want uh, the code to be public or private. I'm going to create a public repository for this demo and then I'm going to click on uh, create repository, right? This repository is currently empty. So in order to add our code here, we need to do two things. First, we need to set up authentication between our local Git setup and the GitHub account. And we do that by generating an SSH key pair by running this command, which generates two keys in separate files, one public and one private. We're going to add the private key on the SSH agent by running the SSH add command and passing the private key. And the public one, we're going to copy and add it on our GitHub profile settings, SSH key, add new key, right? Basically, this is how we authenticate our local machine to the remote GitHub account. This is basically a required step if you want to add code on a remote repository. Now, going back to our repository, we need to copy this command and run it in the terminal on our local repository. What this does is to simply connect the remote repository to our local one. We can have multiple remote repositories for the same local one, but we're not going to dive into this topic right now. Now, finally, to add our code on the remote repository, we need to run this command, which is basically the git push command. Origin is a short name for the remote repository that we just added. Minus U stands for setup stream for the current branch, which is the master branch. We're going to talk about branches in a second. But now if we refresh the repository page, we can see our code being added in the remote repository. We have all the files here, and also we can see a list of commits with the names, IDs, the developer which made the change, and of course, the actual uh, changes. Now, if a new developer comes in, it needs to download this repository on its local machine, and it does this by going here on the clone area and copying this link, and then it goes to the terminal and runs this git clone command followed by the copied link and the code is downloaded and also the remote repository is configured out of the box. This is actually the most common workflow when you start working on an existing project because the code already exists on the remote repository and you have to clone the repository to be able to add contributions to it. GitHub is a very useful and complex system that allows us to see a number of stats around the contributions like the number of commits, the push frequency, the developer productivity, and lots of other things. I highly encourage you to play around on the UI to see how it works. Now let's shift gears and talk about branches. A branch branch is nothing more than a chain of commits, right? By default, a new repository has a single branch called the master branch. And in a usual workflow, developers create other branches called feature branches, where they add more commits by working on a feature. And when a feature is ready, the branch is merged into the master branch and other developers can see the changes and create other branches and so on and so forth. When you create a new branch, you basically work on a copy of your code that you modify with every commit, which is completely independent on the code that lives on the master branch. So basically you can see a branch just like a sandbox environment where you can experiment with your code. To create a new branch, you need to say git checkout minus b followed by the name of the branch that you want to create. Let's say feature one in this case, and then you need to provide a remote branch you want to derive from. In this case, origin forward slash master. Now you can see that the prompt has changed because this item team shows us the current branch we're working on. And also IntelliJ IDEA shows us that in the bottom right corner. On this new branch, we can make changes as usual. Let's create two commits. 
and uh, we want to push them on the remote repository by running git push minus f which stands for force followed by remote short name and then the local branch name which is feature one and then the remote branch we want to create which for simplicity let's keep it the same as the local one now if we go to the github page we can see this pop-up which says that uh, we have a new branch created and if we click on compare and pull request we can see our changes and our commits and we can create a pull request with those changes a pull request is basically a set of changes that you want to be reviewed by other developers before getting merged into the master branch developers refer to them as prs just to keep the naming short after the developers approve the PR, you can simply merge it into the main branch by clicking on this button. This is basically the usual development workflow for a team that contributes to a project. Now in the next video about Git, we're going to learn different ways we can merge a feature branch into a master branch, the way we can deal with uh, the same files being modified on two different branches, or in other words, the way we deal with conflicts in Git, the way we can explore an older version of our application, what is a rebase and why and how can we do it, and a couple of other tips and tricks around Git workflows. Thank you for watching, I really hope you found this video useful, make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons and I'll see you in the next one.